Actually, Rahul started philosophy. Uh, I will briefly go over it and then move over to the motion. Uh, I, I will, uh, I think, we sat here and reminded me several times, and Antonio has also, about uh, giving you some kind of a uh, some kind of material that will help you get ready for exam three, which is next week, right? So uh, I'll be, I usually don't do it for exam three, I do it for the final exam, uh, but I will, I will prepare something that'll, that, that should make you aware of what are the areas that I'm going to emphasize in exam three. Okay, so that, that way, uh, yeah. The test is on Thursday, right? Yeah. So I, up until Tuesday's material is in principle in exam three, but of course, this week's stuff and whatever spills over, yeah. Right. Yeah, the test is next week. We have a week now. Okay. So the idea of elasticity theory actually has to do with springs. And it's a very powerful theory, and it's something that we, that we use on our regular day-to-day -day life quite a bit. The idea is that if you have, let's say you have a spring, and you pull this spring, uh, suppose you pull the spring with some force F, then what happens is that uh, this one will get stretched, right, to some larger length, so it becomes longer, and therefore the spring would want to go back to its original unstretched length. That's what springs do, and you know that. If you compress the spring, it will like to come back to its unstretched position. So in other words, if you pull a spring and let it go, it will oscillate back and forth. So we'll come to the oscillation part later, but now let us first understand a few things. How this elongation happens. So suppose I apply a force F to the right, the displacement is going to be to the right. In other words, if this was the edge of the spring, it's been displaced in the direction in which I applied my force, because I am pulling the spring. Now, the spring, however, wants to go back to its original equilibrium position. So the spring, therefore, generates its own restoring force, and we'll call it the spring force F sub S. So by Newton's third law, Fs and F have the same numerical values, because they're equal and opposite forces. F is the force I gave to the spring to move it to the right, and Fs is the force <clears throat> the spring came up with as an equal and opposite force, but of same magnitude. So if I write the equation describing what this force does, this is an equation that we have done before. The force I apply dictates what's the stretch, displacement of the edge of the spring x, and the constant here is the spring constant k, f equals kx. And I called uh, this as Hooke's law. So since fs is equal and opposite to f, fs therefore is minus kx. And since we are talking about, we are more interested in the force on the spring, typically this equation is something that we'll worry about when we talk about what the spring does. So in other words, if you were to make a plot, let's say, uh, of force versus x, then as far as this part is concerned, what I am doing, it will be like this with the slope being k, whereas what the spring is doing, it will be like that with the slope being uh, minus k. So this is the spring force law. So when one talks about Hooke's law, Hooke's law, one is talking about this fs equals minus kx. Of course, eventually we'll drop the s once we understand what we are doing. So that's one thing. Now let's say, let's talk about the elongation process. So if I stretch the spring, the spring used to be in this position originally, and now say it has gotten stretched by some length delta l. So just to complete the argument, I would say the original length was l. Okay. So it is therefore reasonable to argue that since I have applied a force that way, 
the F or the FS. Let's look at, let's look at uh, F in general. Then this delta L, how much it has stretched by, should be proportional to how hard I pulled it. All right, so that, that's nothing abnormal about that. Delta L should be proportional to F. It turns out, however, that delta L is more if the spring is longer. So if you have a slinky, for example, and if you pull a slinky, the stretch would be quite large. If you have a tight little spring inside your watch, well, nowadays watches don't have springs anymore, but if you have one of those, you know, you pull it with the same force, the elongation would be much tinier. So delta L, therefore, is also proportional by that argument to the length of the spring itself. Okay. So let's now take two springs and pull both of them. Attach the end. The length again here is say L. And now suppose I apply the very same force and pull it, and it ends up here. And now say the stretch is delta L. So the question for you is, if I apply the same force to two springs instead of one spring, whether the new delta L for the two springs together being pulled will be less than the delta L for the single spring or more? Will it? So again, to, to state the question, here there was one spring and I pulled and this was delta L as I said and delta L is proportional to L. Here I have two springs and I'm pulling both the springs simultaneously. <coughs> Would the delta L be more or the same or less than the previous case, single spring case? Just think about it. Yes. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. You also think it's less? Rest of you have no guess? Come on. So, okay, so let's just visualize it. This is one of the things that I, I want you guys to really become expert at at this point, because this is one of the reasons why you, many of you are having trouble doing physics and you get nervous and worried and freak out. Just think, just, just imagine, instead of two springs, take, take 50 springs, let's say. You applied the same force. Wouldn't it be harder to pull if, if there were 50 springs instead of one? Right? It should be, right? So in other words, if I, make, uh, if I make the thing thicker with many, 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 many springs, then it will be harder to pull. So therefore, delta L should be less than for a single spring, which would be easier to pull. So this is the mental image I want you to think about. So in other words, it's easy to see that delta L actually would be inversely proportional to the number of springs that are there. So if I have hundreds of springs, this delta L would become quite small. So we can now translate this observation to something quite interesting. So why did I start with springs? I started with springs basically because I want to get into a discussion of something much more complex, like a wire. So this is a blown up cartoon of a wire. So whatever this wire is made of, it's got zillions of atoms, and, and it's, it's roughly, let's say, let's say cylindrical. And I, just like I was doing there, suppose I pull this here with my force F, and then there is a restoring force given by this wire, Fs. And I can imagine, at the very simplest level, that this wire is made out of millions and millions of springs, just like I had there. I had two springs, but now let's imagine it has few million or few billion springs. So as if this wire is just a collection of such springs. So if that were the case, then I should be able to write that delta L is not only proportional to F, so as F grows, L, uh, as F is large, increases, L, delta L increases, I can also say it's proportional to L. So I'm basically putting together all my observations out there in, in terms of proportionality. 
and it's inversely proportional to now that if you have a zillion springs here, we can think about the presence of zillion springs in terms of a cross section, uh, which is something that we call A, let's say. How thick is the wire? So I can make it inversely proportional to the number of springs. I can replace that by A. So now we have an interesting equation. <coughs> and the way to look at this equation, the standard way to look at the, this equation, which is done almost always by engineers. So when engineers test the material, this is one of the first tests that they focus on. And there are extremely sophisticated or very, very simple tests that can be uh, done to study these systems, these kind of relations. And the way, the way one writes it is force over area. So this part here is proportional to delta L over L. That's how it's written. Force per unit area is proportional to delta L over L. Force per unit area has a name in, in condensed matter physics. Force per unit area has a name. Force per, per unit area is what we call, in this case, stress. It's basically pressure, but it's also the same as stress. Okay. Can you please uh, ask her to pay attention? One next to you. Can you pay attention to what we are doing in class? And this is strain. So these are technical words in our studies now. What is stress? Stress is force per unit area. What is strain? Strain is the, the stretch that has happened or the squeeze that has happened with regard to the original length. So one of the things that you should see now is that this is length on the top. So this has dimension of length on the top. And this also has dimension of length in the bottom. In other words, that should cancel out, which means that this strain is a pure number. Okay? But force per unit area is not a pure number. Force is in newtons, and this is in meters, meters squared. So this, therefore, stress is in newtons per meter squared. So this equation, now you have to convert this proportionality into an equation. And the way it works is force per unit area is equal to some constant, which is denoted usually by y, delta L over L. Some books call it E, but it's OK. I think it's better to call it y. This y is called the Young's modulus. So a Young's modulus is a measure of how soft or how hard it is to pull a material. Okay? That's what a Young's modulus is. So if you have a stainless steel wire, which is, by the way, often used when you're traveling over hanging bridges, you probably have driven over Golden Gate Bridge. Many of the bridges uh, around the country and around the world are suspension bridges. They're actually suspended by wires. So you're putting your life on the strength of their Young's modulus without really knowing it, right? So in other words, the Young's modulus, therefore, is typically a very large number because, because the stress, a large amount of stress, can typically cause a small amount of strain. That's what you would ideally want, right? You want a large load to give you a small strain. You don't want to be going, going on a bridge that simply sags down because you got on the bridge. That'll be a, <laughs> that'll not be a nice bridge, right? Certainly not be a very reassuring bridge. Imagine going over a bridge made of nylon. It'll be a lot of fun. Try it out. So what I'm trying to tell you is that for stainless steel, the Young's modulus, therefore, is a large number, whereas for nylon, Young's modulus is a much smaller number. All right? So let's now carry on with that argument. This equation, therefore, is a very important equation, which is the stress-strain uh, equation. And that's what typically becomes a very important engineering problem. Let's do a simple example. Suppose the radius of the wire uh, is 0.5 centimeters. 
Okay? Convert it, this to meters and so on. If you do that, this would imply that cross-sectional area A, which would be pi times r squared, right? That's the area of a circle. So cross-sectional area, uh, so cross-sectional area here would be this cross-sectional area. So if you do the numbers, it comes out to eight times uh, ten to the minus five meters squared. Okay, that's your a. Now a is very important because I have a coming in here. Suppose you apply a force. So again, this is a wire. Okay, just a, just just the kind of wire that I had. You apply a force. And suppose this is a large force, 5,000 newtons. So basically, 500 kilograms times times g, approximately. So now let's see what delta L would be for stainless steel. So for example, uh, I can I can calculate here that given what I know, force per unit area. The force is a large force. The unit area is a small area. So a thin wire is supporting a large force. Then the force per unit area is 6.3, if you do the math, times 10 to the uh, plus 7 uh, newtons uh, per meter square. Uh, for actually, OK. Uh, one of the things I should have told you is I've taken the length of this wire as 1 meter. So it is force per unit area times L, which in other words, force per unit area times L. L is brought on this side. And this number is, therefore, Newton per meter squared times a meter. So therefore, Newton per meter in the right All right? Any questions so far? OK. So from here, actually, you can calculate. Uh, if, you, if you know delta L or if you know Y, you can find one or the other. Now, for stainless steel, you can look up uh, delta, uh, look up Y. Uh, stainless steel has a Y value, which is roughly 20 times 10 to the 10 newtons per meter squared. So if you now uh, put in that y value, so therefore you can find, uh, let's go back to our equation, f over a is equal to y times delta L over L. So we make it into uh, delta L times y is equal to f over a times L, which is what this is here. So I put that in, right? Uh, so therefore that means my delta L would be f over a times l divided by y. So I know y. And if you do the math and do the right conversions, it's 3 times 10 to the minus 4 meters, which is therefore of the order of 0 0.3 millimeters. So a 500 kilogram mass traveling uh, or, or pulling on this wire would essentially give you a stretch of 0.3 millimeters. Why then do we, uh, uh, you know, so, okay, so this is part of the reason why stainless steel or, or this kind of materials are often used for making suspension bridges or things that carry heavy, heavy loads using in various crane parts and so on and so forth. So just to give you a sense of, a sense of numbers, the Young's modulus for nylon is roughly 1 upon 55 times Young's modulus for steel. It's not enormously different, though. Now, of course, there are many, many kinds of nylons. So it's not like all, you know, all nylons have the same number. But this is just one, one example. So if that's the case, and if you repeat this calculation for a nylon wire, just to give you, an, give you a sense of numbers, the delta L will come out to 1.7 uh, centimeter, so much, much longer for the exact same numbers. So this should give you some sense of how these stretches are controlled by these wires. Now, this is important because this is something that's used all the time. Now, one thing that I should make you aware is that these relations all have their regime of validity. So in other words, if I were to plot stress and strain, so this is the strain 
delta L over L, and this is the stress F over A, clearly, because of the Young's modulus relation, you would expect that this will be a curve like that, right? Because uh, the equation that you have is F over A is equal to some slope Y times delta L over L. So this is your X, and this is your Y axis, and, and this is your constant, big Y y equals mx. So the slope, therefore, is your Young's modulus. It turns out that if you keep increasing the stress, then you're in inventing trouble, because this linear relationship will break down and will actually change completely on you. And that's where you don't want to be. In other words, every material that you use for carrying load has a load limit. If you exceed that limit, then that material can fail. All right? So all materials, therefore, have their load limit. That said, of course, uh, most of these materials can handle stress and strain for a very long time, but there are limitations. For example, most airplanes that we ride, ride on, their average lives typically can be 60, 70 years. Okay? And how do we know that the plane's OK? Because there is something called non-destructive evaluation you can actually have various ways of looking inside the, the material. And when you do that, you see the material may be looking perfectly smooth and no problem, or as it ages, it starts to develop tiny, tiny cracks. Okay? And that's when you want to fix the material, you want to change the material. So, so the reason why oftentimes you'll find that there's airplane maintenance going on, for example, is because of these reasons. That, you know, these things are regularly done between flights. Uh, sometimes, every so often, depending on what is being looked at, to see how, whether there is material fatigue setting in. And this exactly is the regime of fatigue. Okay? So this is called, in technical jargon, the elastic regime. That's this part. However, this part is called the plastic regime. Nothing to do with plastic as a material, but this part is called the plastic regime. So you don't want the material to get to plastic regime, because then its behavior becomes unpredictable, and it also becomes prone to failure. All right, now let me go back to springs and set up uh, the physics of oscillations of springs. Any questions on this so far? OK. So. So suppose this is my spring. Let's imagine there's a tiny mass here, because the spring is massless. So this is just a way of making the right kind of cartoon. And uh, suppose that I give it a stretch. I take it to this point by applying a force. The spring, of course, will give me uh, a restoring force, as I would call it, which is my FS. Restoring force, don't forget this name. So why are you playing with your phone? Okay. Anyway, pay attention to what we are doing. Yeah. All right. So, so I have now stretched it, and, and this, suppose, has been stretched by some amount x, just like before, okay, just like I have done before. So if I now do something to track what happens to the spring as it moves back and forth, I would see some interesting things. And this is easy to kind of visualize. Just imagine that the spring's been stretched, and you let it go. So if you let it go, then the spring should come back to its relaxed position. And after it has come back to its relaxed position, it wouldn't stop. It will actually compress the spring. And then it compresses it enough that there is pushback. The spring goes back to its relaxed position. <laughs> But now it can't stop. So it goes back to its stretch position. And now it goes back again. So in other words, if I were to make a movie of this, if I were to make a movie of this, let's say along this axis, I talk about position. Position of this mass, that is, this mass at the edge. And on this axis, it's time. 
and this is time equal to zero. I start some stopwatch, and therefore time increases as I go vertically downward. Let's say this is the starting position, the stretch, this is the relaxed position, and this is the compressed position. I'm just describing it along a line. Imagine with some numbers. Then what will happen is that this is this, so the it's already been stretched. As I let go of it, it's going to go to its relaxed position. It's going to overshoot its relaxed position, go to the squeezed position, which is here, unsqueeze, go to the relaxed position, overshoot, and go to the maximum stretch, and this will repeat itself. I'm just drawing a cartoon of the displacements of this mass. Remember, I've taken this mass here, that's here. The mass now goes back, goes back, compresses, goes here, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Okay, it's a good question. Right now, it won't. Right now, it won't because there is no energy loss. So it will decrease over time in reality, right? In a real normal experiment, if you and I do it, you will see that it will eventually slow down and stop. So that's a very, very good question. Indeed, it will. But that's because there are dissipative forces at play. For example, there may be dissipation from the medium, which is air. Uh, the way you have set up the spring, it may be on a table, so there can be frictional forces. So if you could eliminate all of them, then it, it will not. So that's the point. So that brings to another important observation that now you can imagine that eliminating dissipative forces is not easy. So therefore, many of these experiments are actually very hard to do, which is why, for example, when you take the physics lab, which you guys do usually in the second semester, what you find is that all those big, big contraptions with all those things, at the end of the day, you are measuring something relatively simple, actually. Nothing, stuff like this that you have learned. So why is that? Because all those big contraptions are needed to create the right conditions such that friction is minimized, this is taken care of, mass is light, spring is light, such that you can ignore the mass of the spring and all that. So real experiments like these are not easy to do. Uh, some of them are, in fact, notoriously difficult. So this is the zero line. This is, this is the line of unstretched uh, thing. So let me now tell you what a period for this is. For the spring to make a one complete round trip, that's a period. That means I start from one extremity and come back to the same extremity. Or if I start from the center, I go and come back to the same center. So that's what, that's what we mean. So the frequency, so this is the period t, and the frequency of the spring is therefore 1 over t. It turns out that uh, for, for springs, so this is frequency. This is something that we have talked about before when we were doing circular motion, but we may have forgotten. Now, another important thing here that comes to play <coughs> is that time period t is related to angular frequency, which comes out very handy, omega. So therefore, omega is 2 pi by t. And since 1 over t is same as f, omega is also 2 pi times f. OK? Omega is 2 pi times f. So, so therefore, when we say frequency, we mean f usually. And when we say omega, we usually talk about angular frequency. So what is the difference between frequency and angular frequency? It's basically that frequency has to be multiplied by 2 pi to give you the angular frequency. It's just how things are. And there is a reason for it. And I'm going to come to that reason in a moment. Now, going back to Bradley's point, how about energy? You already know that if a spring's been stretched, its energy is k times uh, x squared at the very simplest level if in this case the stretch is x. So in other words, if I make the spring such that so this is my x equal to 0, let's say. And this, let's say this is x equal to some amplitude a. So this is the maximum stretch on the right. And the maximum stretch on the left, therefore, will be x equal to minus a, right? because it's symmetric. 
x equal to a and x equal to minus a. So I know that the potential energy of the spring, let's call it PE for now, potential energy of the spring I've already taught you some time back is half kx squared. So therefore I can say that over here, over here, I have taken the spring here and let it go. So because I have taken the spring at the stretched point and let it go, at this point, before I let it go, at the mo just until the moment I let it go, the kinetic energy here is going to be zero because the motion hasn't begun yet. However, the system has energy because I have stretched the spring. And all its energy must be potential energy. So therefore, initially, at t equal to zero, let me just remind you here, in the way I've set up the problem, at t equal to zero for now, I can write my total energy as one half k times instead of x, I can write a squared. This is very important, this part. And students lose students lose points right and left when they start asking about this. If you have anything that is unclear at all, have it clarified and you know, make sure you understand it. So therefore, the total energy at this position, as I let it go, is half k a squared. Kinetic energy is 0 because there is no motion. All right? Now you see, at this position, something weird happens. Potential energy, which is half k a squared, is 0 because it's at zero position. So it has no potential energy, which means by energy conservation, at the middle, all energy is kinetic. Yes? I couldn't hear you. Yes, it's called amplitude. When you talk about A, so maximum displacement has a name. In simple harmonic motion, maximum displacement is called amplitude. So that's why one typically uses the symbol capital A. Not small a, but capital A. Okay. So, so at this point, let's give it names now. Let's call it uh, P, let's call it Q, and let's call this O. So this is potential energy at O. This is total energy at A. This is kinetic energy at A. So you see, potential energy at O is 0. This is O, O, almost, OK? Don't confuse the, the, two, the two. One is an O, one, one is a 0. If you want, I can write the 0 in the more fancy side. All right. So now you see on this side, as the, as the, as the mass swings back, I again have a scenario where uh, why am I calling it A? I should be calling it P. Uh, P, I'm sorry. Uh, so therefore, at Q, at this point, EQ, I again have half k A squared. Because although A is now minus A, when I squared the thing, minus A squared is same as A squared. So it's again, so at this point, it's again half k A squared. Now at this point, the motion stops because the spring has gotten super squeezed and it's going to go back. So therefore, the kinetic energy at Q is equal to 0. OK? Kinetic energy at Q is equal to 0. Yes? So the total energy Correct. Total energy is the same always because of the thing we discussed. Energy is not lost. I'm just giving you the important positions as the spring goes back and forth. So at the extreme positions, because I started with a stretch, at the extreme position, energy is all potential here and all potential here. On the other hand, it's all kinetic smack in the middle. And that's what you should have, because if you think about, think about a pendulum. A pendulum starts from here, let's say. Kinetic is 0. Speeds up, slows down, turns around, speeds up, slows down. So smack in the middle, you would expect kinetic energy to be maximized. However, at the edges, you would expect kinetic energy to become 0, but energy is conserved. So that means potential energy 
takes over. And that's exactly what I'm drawing for you. So in general, energy uh, at any point let's say described by position x. x can be at a, x can be at 0, x can be at minus a, x can be none of those, but within those two bounds, then this energy would be 1 half k x squared, because that's potential, plus 1 half m v squared, which is kinetic energy. So what is this m? This m is a mass that I talked about. Um, I drew a mass here, right? This is your, this is your m. <coughs> so this, this, this is really important because this, this is extremely uh, helpful in analyzing what will come next, which, which is a little bit more complicated than what I've done. So right now, let's, let's get everything clarified. What are the issues that you're having so far? Tell me, because this part people will fumble a lot, I know. At, at O, yeah, at a. right, don't confuse the O with the 0. Sorry. At O, it is half mv squared because the way I have begun it is by stretching the spring and letting it go, so it's going to speed up. And the maximum speed is going to be smack in the middle, okay? So, yes. <laughs> yes. So this is when I start my clock. It's not terribly important right now, but it will become terribly important two minutes later. That's why I wrote it down. So just imagine that I'm starting this process, right? So if I want to measure what's happening, I have to get a stopwatch going. So I have chosen that point, in this case point P, to get my stopwatch going. That's what I'm doing. That's why t equal to 0 is set there. But I can set t equal to 0 anywhere, right? There is nothing hard and fast about where I set t equal to 0. It's just, it's just something that you do for convenience. Any, any other things that are bugging you? So this is complicated, obviously. So just make sure that you don't mess it up. Because I am going to be asking you questions on this uh, on Tuesday. All right. So now, now that the total energy uh, our energy in general is one half uh, k x squared, which is this is the potential part plus one half m v squared. Um, so this is in general, right? I should be able to immediately then reduce that energy at point P or at point Q doesn't matter. So P comma Q is simply one half K A squared, as I said, because those are what are called the turning points of motion. Because the thing stops before it turns around. Those are the turning points of motion. are the turning points of motion. Turning point of motion means when the motion goes from one direction, stops, reverses direction. So therefore, at the turning points of motion, you don't have any kinetic energy. And hence, it's all potential. And at O, on the other hand, there is no potential energy because x is 0, which means you have only kinetic energy, so it's half mv squared. So therefore, actually, you have a way of relating v and x. So therefore, uh, I can write it in the following way. Um, I can say, OK, let me. <coughs> I can say that energy at p comma q is equal to half k a squared. And this must also be energy anywhere, which is half 
mv squared plus half k x squared because total energy is conserved or total energy is con constant. Okay? So that, that last line is very important because that last line gives you the capability of finding V at any point X. So if I write for now V with X in parentheses, it means V as a function of X. That means V is at any point X. So V at any point X therefore can be thought of as one half k a square minus one half k x square and just to make it work right for now first step I should write it like this. So I have just moved the terms around. I have extricated if you will half m v squared. Now I have just tried to remind you that the value of v depends upon the position x. V is not constant. V therefore varies. Since there is a half everywhere, we can happily take care of the half by cancelling it out. And I can also simplify the side because there is k uh, which is sticking out. So I can write it as a squared minus x squared. Okay? So now you see I can write v as a function of x squared is k over m a squared minus x squared. And therefore v is at any x. That's the power of this formula. That's why I've been telling you it's important. So this is v at any x. That will be equal to square root of k over m times square root of a squared minus x. Okay? Any questions so far? Okay. So, So now you see something very interesting can be constructed. What is the interesting that thing that can be done? It looks messy, but it's actually quite simple. From what I have told you so far, as the mass oscillates back and forth, so this is again your wall, this is again your spring, massless spring, mass at the end, and these are the extremities. This is P, this is Q, this is O, right? At T equal to zero, I said I set my initial condition to be such that I start at this point. This is my, let's say, time axis. This axis I won't label now because I would I would have it for various purposes. So if I were to lay out the how the x goes around as time moves forward, it'll be like that, which I already showed you. But let's see what happens to velocity. So this is by the way t equal to zero, where the position was maximum. So I'll call this the curve for x. Now, can you tell me when I have stretched the spring to the maximum, what about the force? Is the force the maximum? If I stretch the spring to maximum, is the force the maximum? Look at Hooke's law. What does Hooke's law tell you? Look at Hooke's law, look at Hooke's law, look at Hooke's law, don't look at me. What happens? That they're proportional. So if x is maximum, then force should be maximum, right? But if force is maximum, 
force is mass times acceleration as per Newton's second law. So I can replace force by acceleration as long as I know there is a multiplier mass. So therefore, force and acceleration should be in tandem. They mean the same thing except for the mass multiplier. So I should be able to then plot out acceleration by just knowing force. Indeed, that's true because I know from Hooke's law, fs is minus k. So I've already plotted x for you. It's, it is now trivial for me to plot a for you because a is the exact opposite of this business that I've drawn. I know I, I won't win an art competition today, but this is your, this dashed line here is your A, which is basically uh, <coughs> minus k over m times x. That's what I'm plotting. All right? So I can actually, without doing anything, I can directly show you that this, this thing should be in the middle. Uh, the drawing is not very good. I'm sorry for that. Uh, this, this thing should come around like this. Uh, so on. But so x and a are going to look like this. What about v? What about the velocity? I can tell you that too. Just look here, because we have already worked things out for velocity. Look, all you need to do is, is to solve this equation here. And if you do that, you find something quite amazing. And in fact, it looks complicated. because. At t equal to 0, here, the velocity is 0. So you plot the velocity starting from here. Velocity is maximum at O. Okay? So at O, it's moving with highest velocity. So this is how velocity is. I should use colors here. but So velocity drawing is a little bit more complicated. But this is how the velocity drawing would go. Uh, let me pull out another color chalk. So at least you know how it looks like. So we'll wrap up this, this part of the problem uh, on Tuesday. And I will give you some work on this to do, just so that you are ready. Because this is a very important chapter in which students tend to have a lot of trouble. So this thing, therefore, is velocity. The next thing we'll do is we will try out a form that x of t that we are plotting here is some a times a sine of, it turns out, something here times time. It turns out this is going to be a sine of omega t. Remember omega? I define omega here. Omega is uh, 2 pi times the frequency. It will turn out that this omega square actually is k over m. That's why I was put, putting on the omega uh, and defining defining omega here and taking pains to do it. All right, let's stop here for now and go to the, go to the quiz. <laughs>